Hello, my name's Nikki Wallace. I'm a designer, writer, researcher, educator, and facilitator, and my work centers around design for transitions through Net Zero Lab, my design studio, and the University of South Australia. My paper focuses on reflective doodling, a critical reflective process that emerged from my PhD research. My thesis explored the designer's role in sustainability transitions and examined the consumption and waste problem using a mixed methods approach spanning analytic autoethnography, case research, action research and reflective practice through a lens of critical pragmatism. Explorations of reflective doodling continue through the Living Lab where I'm facilitating workshops to examine how this method could benefit designers working on complex or wicked problems. This presentation will explore what reflective doodling is by unpacking a few different doodles with the aim of making the tacit processes more explicit. So in my own research, reflective doodling emerged as a mindful practice. It was a way of unwinding without completely letting go of my thoughts and was mindful in its process, the act of doodling, and in its outcome, the state of relaxation. But it also emerged as a critical reflective practice, one that arose from relaxation to facilitate a deeper processing of ideas. It provided a method for critically examining concepts and theories to see their intersections and explore them in visual ways. Reflective doodling also leads to what Csikszentmihalyi calls a flow state, an actively creative yet relaxed state from which thoughts and ideas can flow. And in both its physical enactment and its reflection on lived experience, reflective doodling is also a form of embodied reflection. It's what Escobar refers to as a dance between action and reflection. Reflecting on the processes revealed that it could be described in terms of types and kinds. So the two distinct types of reflective doodling are thinking while drawing and drawing to think. And the three kinds are doodling to understand, doodling to explore and doodling to communicate. The use of each kind within both types reveals how fluid their nature is and it is a kind of dance. So let's take a quick look at the role played by visual language. Brown highlights 12 primary forms in her visual alphabet and forms can be used to create combination codes and an arrow is a great example of a combination code. Both of these arrows suggest direction but the combination coding adds nuance to this so that the top arrow follows a linear path, but the bottom arrow suggests a different kind of movement. You know, the line is more playful, the, lo the loop implies a non-linear path. A doodler can develop a visual language that becomes a kind of shorthand that they can use to move them through their process quickly. And this is really helpful in note taking when doing rapid ideation or when just trying to capture racing thoughts. How different elements like these are used is worth noting as we continue to explore more doodles. So let's have a look at thinking while drawing. Although many practitioners think while they draw, this is more common for ideation. In reflective doodling, the process is harnessed as a way of processing new theoretical knowledge and concepts. So this doodle was created during reflection on Sartre's concept of bad faith, which is essentially lying to ourselves to justify our actions, which can also impact our identity. So this doodle used illustrated type to unpack this concept. And on face value, it's nothing special, you know, it's just a doodle, but the process of creating it unlocked a larger critical thinking process. Each mark, each stroke, each block of color was made while thinking particularly about bad faith, and specifically about bad faith's role in hyperconsumption, which was one of the focuses of my research. What really differentiates reflective doodling from other drawing processes are the roles played by critical thinking, the context, and inputs into the thought process. In this doodle, it was the relation between bad faith and the socioeconomic concept of hyperconsumption in the context of design. Reflective doodling uses drawing to let the mind wander and critical thinking to make that wandering more pointed. So this is page six of about 10 pages of note taking from a workshop with Tony Fry. And it's fairly representative of my note taking and documentation style, which I recognize on reflection contains multiple embodied reflections. Now this discovery was quite unexpected, but these notes have become this tangible example of reflection in action, which is typically tacit and, and goes unnoticed. 
The process of documenting and reflecting is an active exchange that's connected to lived experience. So the rapid shifts between action and reflection become the dance of embodied reflection. Here, doodling is used as a way of thinking about the notes. As key themes and insights become visual notations, their concepts are considered more deeply and another cycle of reflection begins. So in these visual notations, the notes become more illustrative and the time taken to arrange them, connect them and make them more visual is used to think and reflect on their content and meaning. Now, it was noted by one of the workshop participants that reflective doodling was more involved mentally than normal note taking. And it was also described as a mind page conversation by another participant. And as you can see, there is an embodied nature to this interactive process. In this version, another layer of synthesis explicitly merges new knowledge with existing knowledge, relevant literature and lived experience, and provocations are made out into the larger context of design and the designed world. Each process was iterative, built knowledge cumulatively, and danced between doodling to understand, doodling to explore, and doodling to communicate. And small parts of these notes are often used to illustrate points in visually simplified ways. And during interviews, discussions explored how the unfinished doodles aided the practitioner's thought process, while the finished doodles created a simple visual em entry point for an audience to engage with complex concepts. So the potential for reflective doodles to improve complex communication for an audience was noted and will be explored through the continuing study as will the usefulness of the process as a form of embodied critical reflection. Now let's have a look at another doodling process, which I hope will provide some more clarity to the usefulness of the different kinds of reflective doodling, as each of these plays a really pivotal role in drawing to think. Doodling is described by Brown as thinking, albeit in disguise, and Amond has observed how for one practitioner in her study, the process of thinking only unfolds as she draws. This idea of drawing being tied to a thinking process is not often understood or made explicit, which Ammon argues has led to the glorification of the paper napkin sketch, this kind of intuitive sketch that's commonly held up as proof of an aha moment of creative genius. And she describes how the napkin sketch is less spontaneous than it seems because there's actually a lot underpinning that spontaneity. So analysis of these kinds of sketches can identify breadcrumbs of a practitioner's thinking. Now, this critique positions drawing as an integral part of the creative thinking process. It's less genius and more part of the hard work that's performed by creatives. Reflective doodling also leaves breadcrumbs of itself in the work, a line here, a thought there, a note in the margins. Each remains part of the doodling artifact as it undergoes continual processes of refinement. Engaging with these breadcrumbs is often non-linear, and newly defined marks can become jump-off points for inquiry, creating a web-like exploration. Watching someone draw to think bears witness to their unfolding thought process, but what's embedded within the doodle is not always fully readable to others. That visual coding that comes from the shorthand of the creator imbues a sketch with meaning that may or may not be known to those outside of the process. And in my own notes, there are shorthand codes from a variety of sources, from visual sketches to stenographer's marks. Some of them are readable, but others are less likely to be understood. Workshop participants also noted their own use of visual cues that acted as a shorthand, captured their thinking, and allowed further engagement through more drawing or through their writing. And drawing to think performs that creative hard work to build new knowledge. So let's unpack this through a series of reflective doodles that explore socio-technical transitions theory using Yield's multi-level perspective, which I'll call the MLP. So by way of a brief overview, the MLP is a theory that describes three levels in socio-technical systems, the landscape, the regime, and the niche. And it looks at how activities in those levels evolve and how they interact in periods of systemic change. This was a catalyzing theory in my PhD, and my research continues to explore its constraints and applications within design. 
Now, using reflective doodling to examine the wicked problem of consumption and waste led to an operationalization of this theory in design contexts. But as seen here, the process began by observing how side notes were often used to highlight the dominant paradigm in the system. The paradigm is important but obscured in the MLP and the origin of my thought process is contained in this doodle that asks worldview, where should it sit? So I doodled with this question in mind, exploring how thinking occurs in systems, how this could be made explicit, and how I might capture more complexity or different understandings of relations within systems. So this is really doodling to understand, and, and that understanding is playing out in multiple ways. Firstly, understanding the MLP and the positioning of things within it. Secondly, by exploring where, structurally speaking, the paradigm should be represented. And lastly, there's a layer of notes that reflect on action and prompt a revisit to the source material to cross-check this understanding against the literature. With that understanding, doodling to explore can be used to play with the theory. So the structure itself evolves here. The focus on paradigms shifts to the social enactment of thinking through ideologies and mindsets. A column is added to explore a possible future. And the visual language is starting to become codified. Noted in the first instance of the in the differentiation between ideology, which uses brace brackets, and mindsets, which uses square brackets. Again, a notation layer captures reflection on action, and you can see there's a pattern emerging in the dynamic shift between reflection in and on action. So each change made in the map dances between doodling to understand and doodling to explore, but despite that fluidity, it remains a process of drawing to think. The objective of the process was to create a visual map of this wicked problem that made sense to me as a designer, that articulated the problem to enable recognition of possible points of intervention and action pathways. I was using doodling to try and operationalize this theory. And then COVID happened, um, <laughs> which is not captured in this paper, but it is in a, a, another paper. So this post-COVID map reflects the generative nature of reflective doodling and how it responds to and reflects adaptive system dynamics. Now, doodling to communicate is the final form of doodling or kind of doodling that we'll discuss. And its aim is simple. Make the complexity easier to understand. Organic shapes are used here to avoid the unintended hierarchy that's communicated in the rows and columns, which is actually more representative of the MLP as a holarchy or a system of nested holons that are both parts of and holes. The volume of data has been reduced to communicate without overwhelming the audience. Now, this doodle is unfinished, but it demonstrates another way of looking at and communicating the MLP. And again, COVID presented an opportunity for this MLP holarchy to be used with even less data on display, to communicate the idea that amplifiers and attractors for climate action were emerging in responses to COVID in the regime without mapping the full detail. So as I continue to dance within this doodling process, reflective doodling reveals even more to me. The problems that designers reflect on are increasingly complex and wicked by nature. So our reflection must also become increasingly informed by theory, by experiences, our own and others, by criticality, by processes, both known and as yet unknown. And this kind of reflection is a learned practice. Designing for systems that are continually adapting requires responses and actions that are as fluid and elastic as they are innately reflective. And this calls for designers to make adequate time for reflection, to find comfort in the chaos, and to be agile thinkers who are willing to change themselves in the process of changing the systems they're embedded within. So I'll finish by reiterating that reflective doodling is more complex than its simple name suggests. It is a critical reflective practice underpinned by a range of inputs that inform its processes. Highly developed critical thinking is necessary for any researcher or practitioner tackling complex problems, and particularly so in design for transitions. I've presented this paper in the hope that through the layered processes of reflective doodling, designers might find new and unexpected synergies between research and practice. Thank you.